Greetings, friends. Welcome to Astronomy on Tap. Thank you for joining us tonight on uh, Monday, November 8th. I'm so confused since daylight savings changed for us. I've been just disoriented entirely. Uh, but here we are um, talking about astronomy and the James Webb Space Telescope and all things space tonight at Astronomy on Tap. Um, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I am a computational astrophysicist at Caltech who will be your MC for this evening's event. And it's gonna be a real, a real doozy of an event for the upcoming launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. This is the first of two events that we have kind of investigating the science and the research that can be done with, with James Webb. So right now it's set to launch uh, only a month and a half or so from now. I think December 18th is the launch date, the, the planned launch date. Hopefully it holds to that. And this event is all about uh, planetary and exoplanetary science that can be done with James Webb. That's one of its focuses. And then we have an event a month from now on Monday, December 6th. What a, a, it's like the first week in, in December that will be all about galaxies and large scale structure um, with two researchers who are going to, who have, excuse me, who have uh, one who is uh, working on building one of the instruments on it, the NearCam instrument, Christina Williams at Arizona is going to join us, and Justin Spilker, who's a um, new professor at Texas A&M is going to be joining us as well. So um, that'll be great. So tune back in in a month. But for now, um, we've got a really, a really cool night planned. Uh, let's see. If this is your your first event, just a quick rundown of how this is going to go. I'll continue to give announcements for the next few minutes, and then I'll introduce our our first speaker, um, Colette Salak, who's going to talk about the origin of beer, the astronomical origins of beer, and and um, and a variety of different things related to to the formation of solar systems and structure in the universe. Uh, using James Webb. And then our second speaker, Sasha Hinckley, is going to speak, uh, joining us from the UK. He's getting up super early in the morning to join us. I don't think he is yet awake, but he uh, he will be um, shortly. I think he's getting up at like 3.30 in the morning to be able to join us. I don't know if he's going to drink a beer. I hope so. I will be. Um, but yeah. Uh, and then the so so 20-ish minutes from Colette, Q&A from you guys. Feel free to type your questions in the in the Facebook Live and the YouTube Live interfaces, and I'll relay them back to our speakers. And then Sasha will speak for 20 or so minutes, and then we'll have Q&A with him. And then the last hour of our event, if you stick around that long, you're welcome to, to leave if you, if you get bored or tired or hungry or drunk, I don't know, whatever. Um, and so the, the last hour will be pub trivia that will be um, astronomically themed and there's a whole interactive way that you guys can answer questions and we see the responses and the whole rest of the audience sees people's responses and it's super fun. So, um, and we'll have a lot of questions related to James Webb Space Telescope science and uh, not all of them will be James Webb, but many of them will be related to James Webb. Uh, let's see, one other announcement, our next, our sister series of events are public lectures called Stargazing Lectures that traditionally were held in an auditorium at Caltech. They're, they're virtual um, up until the end of this calendar year. Hopefully we'll, we'll get the clearance to do these in person again in January. I will, con I will do everything I can to continue to record them and post them online for those of you who are not local to Los Angeles and Pasadena, so you can still participate. Um, but our next one is in a couple of weeks, 10 days or so, given by Nikita Kamraj. It's on our, our YouTube uh, channel already, you can you can click and see. Um, she will be talking about accreting black holes and and how we learn about the corona that surrounds them and 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 what's interesting about that and how it how it releases energy and all sorts of things. So um, I encourage you if you are a black hole aficionado and want to learn more, um, definitely check that out in a couple of weeks. Okay, enough of me yapping. Um, Colette, you want to, you want to jump in here? Sure. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. Um, what's your, what's your background? All the telescopes. This is Kitt Peak National Observatory. Oh yes. Kitt Peak. 
Arizona. Outside of Tucson. That's right. Yeah. So Colette and I uh, <laughs> met. Uh, we were both we were both at University of Arizona as as postdocs a few years back. But um, Colette is now a professor at Vassar. In Vassar's in Poughkeepsie. Poughkeepsie, New York. Poughkeepsie. Is it cold there yet? Yes, way too cold. Oh, it is. I miss oh. California. <laughs> yeah, it's not cold here. It's not cold here at all. Um, cool. Well, thank you for joining me. Do you have Do you have a beverage? Yes, I'm a fan of cider. Ooh. This is a rosé, dry cider. Oh, a ro- that sounds. It's from cool. Austin, Austin East Ciders. Interesting. Is it good? It's very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. If they want to sponsor me, I'm all for it. Can, yeah. Okay. Well, well are there any, uh, <laughs> what's it called? East Siders? Is East Siders. The, Austin any, East Siders. Any, any East Siders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's got your back here. I'm drinking um, plane or satellite? Question mark. It's a, a, a hazy double IPA. Well, hopefully this isn't too strong for me. Um, from Bottle Logic, which is here in Los Angeles, which is a pretty pretty good brewery. I'm hoping that the combination, so I got my my COVID booster this morning, which may have been a tactical mistake because I was feeling a little bit woozy uh, over the course of the day. And I was like, uh-oh, maybe this wasn't the best idea to get this right before <laughs> astronomy on tap, but I'm feeling much better now. So I encourage everybody to get their boosters if they're, if it's, a, if it's an option. Um, I'd much rather be woozy for half a day than actually get COVID, which sounds pretty rough. Uh, okay, so I am going to introduce our speaker. Dr. Colette Salek is a professor at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York, where she teaches classes about the solar system, extrasolar planets, and observational astronomy. She also helps run the campus observatory and performs research on the formation of planets using both ground and space-based telescopes, including the future James Webb Space Telescope, Colette is bad at making up her mind about which hobbies to pursue, enjoying just about every outdoor sport, various crafts, and playing music. Oh, what do you play? I play violin and viola. Ooh. Ooh. Do you ever play cello? I love the cello. No, but yeah, cello is way cooler than violin. Well, I don't know if it's cooler. I just like that it has huge range in terms of its its, uh, performance. But okay. Um, Thank you for joining us, and I'll I'll let you take it away. All right, share my screen. All right, how's this look camera? Can you see it? Looks great. Yeah. All right, so so my talk is called "Where Does Beer Come From?" JWST will tell us. You can see JWST here, um, and some beer. I think that's alcohol. If I if I picked the right molecule from the web and some yeast. I don't think JWST is actually going to see yeast, but you get the idea. So if you have, if you're kind of an aficionado of, of space, or you like thinking about space, you may have heard this idea that really we're all made of star stuff. And this is a famous quote from Carl Sagan. And so It is true that ultimately, where does everything come from, including beer, everything comes from a star. So it either comes from the inside of a star or from a star death. And there's actually a recycling process that happens. So stars die and that that death feeds the birth of new stars and so on. And so we think everything on earth and in us and in our beer ultimately came from a star at some point. But along with star birth comes the birth of planets. So this on the left, by the way, is a real picture of a star forming region. On the right side, that's actually just an artist's rendition of where planets form. But what's interesting is as the planets form, the star stuff isn't shared equally by all of the planets. And that's actually what gives us all the different kinds of planets we have in the solar system. And on a very high level, it's really what gives us a colorful solar system. So if if we weren't partitioning all of the star stuff differently into all the different planets, we wouldn't have such a colorful planetary system. And I think Sasha is going to talk about extrasolar planets. So maybe he can tell us whether, whether we know how colorful other planets are around other stars. So this is what I do for a living. By the way, planet formation, the um, planets in general are just a byproduct of star formation. So we got kind of lucky that planets exist at all. 
So what kind of star stuff do the planets need to end up with if we want to have beer? So I think it boils down to a couple of things. One is um, really all of the atoms that we think are required by life. So the most common ones that we find in life are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, known as Chan for short. And we need to have water in liquid form. And really, I think if, if you really get down to the basics, that's all you need for, for beer. Because if you stir that up, we think, or, or biologists think, if you can put those together and stir them up, you can get life. All right, so <laughs> there's a little game that I would play in real time, but I hear there's a little bit of a delay for all of you. So I'm gonna let you just play in your minds. So what we're gonna ask is for each of these planets in the solar system, do we have those special ingredients to have beer? Beer or no beer? So Mercury, answer there, big no. Mercury has no atmosphere, it can't hold on to any water. Um, extreme environment there, so not so conducive to beer. Poor, poor Mercury. Poor yes. Mercury. <laughs> All right, Venus. Okay, so Venus is a really strange one. Um, if we didn't know anything about Venus, in fact, we didn't know very much about Venus 100 years ago, we thought it might be a beer planet, um, but it's a terrible, horrific planet with uh, sulfuric acid and super high temperatures, so no beer there. All right, I think we know the answer to Earth. Earth definitely has lots of beer and cider. Mars is an interesting case. Mars is kind of in between. We're not 100% sure. Maybe it had some beer in the past or could hold some beer in the future, but doesn't seem to have it right now. Jupiter, no, it, it's kind of a terrible environment for life. Saturn, no, Uranus, no, and Neptune, no. So what you see is that Having beer is kind of a special thing. It's not every place that can have this beer available. So this is something known as the habitable zone. Maybe you've heard about this. It was published in a very famous paper on April 1st, 2017. So you can read about it more there. So that's your habitable zone, very hard to say. Um, and so maybe you've heard about this. It's kind of this idea that there's like a Goldilocks zone around a star where you have just the right temperature for liquid water. Um, but what you may not have heard about before is that it's not really obvious how the liquid water got there to begin with. Um, and so here is your quiz for today. How did the water get to Earth to begin with? So your option A is maybe it's born with it. And option B, thousands of comets bombarded Earth over millions of years, slowly delivering tiny pieces of Earth's oceans. Cameron, are you able to see the answers that people are giving? Let me see one second. Uh, there's a little bit of a lag. Um, so let's see. What, what, do, do, you what do you guys think? What do you think, Cameron? Oh, um, I think there's a little bit of a combination, but I think it's more B. I think it's more cometary bombardment. But I know, well, I'll, I mean, I'll let you, I'll, I don't, I'll let you explain all this because you're much better at this than I am. But I thought in general, in the interior of the solar system, volatiles didn't stick around, but is it possible the earth migrated in its position like maybe it had more stuff and then it slowly mm. got into the inner solar. i just don't know enough about planetary migration orbits interesting all right so what does the audience think oh the a audience b? says b b b mostly b, <laughs> mostly both. b one all person right. says a i think i think they're the students that always know that the professor writes the the longer answer to the right question <laughs> <laughs> or the right the longer one is the right one all right so the answer is b but the first time I heard this, it sounded totally crazy. I mean, this idea that um, Earth got bombarded with thousands of comets. So let me just like walk you through that story. So here's what we think we actually need to get water on Earth. You start forming your star because your planets are your byproduct of star formation. You actually need a Jupiter. So you have to form your Jupiter first. <laughs> then you need to form thousands and thousands of comets. Then you need to form your Earth. And then you need to shoot those comets all around. How do they get shot around? Well, Jupiter kicks them around. 
And you have to hope that some amount of them, enough of them make it to earth to give us our water and our oceans. So it's this like totally convoluted story um, that seems to be our current best understanding of how water got to earth. Um, I say our current best understanding, it's, it's not 100% a done deal, so we're not entirely sure. And so one of the interesting things about thinking about the solar system is that it's kind of like if you want to study planet formation and you're just looking at the solar system, I think it's like learning how to cook by just looking at dirty dishes. So actually, planet formation is inefficient, meaning that most of the stuff that you start with goes away. So it's like, you know, you've eaten all the food <laughs> and you're just looking at the dregs that are left um, at the bottom of the cup or something like that. And so I think what's the solution? Watch the Great British Bake Off because that will actually show you the process. So you heard it here first. JWST is the Great British Bake Off for planet formation. Um, and what's JWST? The James Webb Space Telescope. So what it does is allows us to watch the actual process as it happens in baby solar systems. So here's what they look like. Um, this is um, not an image that JWST will be able to see, but it's an image that a telescope can see in the Atacama Desert called the Atacama Large Milli Millimeter Array. And this is a sample of a few of these baby solar systems that we've seen. And I can try to give you a little sense of what you're looking at. So you're just seeing the brightness of these regions where planets form. And anytime you see a little ring, so for example, here, you can see these little rings. We think that there's a planet actually forming in one of those rings and it kind of like clears out the, the vicinity of where it's forming. So what is JWST gonna do? It will split all the light that comes to the telescope into its component colors. And then it measures how much light there is of each color. So on the left, that's a, a CD. I know people these days like, the young kids, they don't even know what CDs are, <laughs> but the old people like me, we know if you hold the CD up, it'll, it'll shine all the colors of the rainbow around. So um, that's actually not far off from the kind of technology that we use inside of a, of a telescope to split the light. And so on the right, um, I was able to Google and find some pictures, what I think are, are some of the, um, what's called a grading or the light splitters in one of the JWST instruments. So you can see, kind of over here, how the rainbow comes out. All right, now I wanna show you this because if you do follow along with JWST in the future, there, you're gonna see a lot of data that looks like this. And I know JWST folks are a little concerned about, you know, is the public gonna be able to understand what they're looking at if they're not just looking at a picture? So I wanna tell you about this. And when you see this stuff coming back from JWST, you can interpret it. So if you've seen a, a prism or um, a, a compact disc splitting the light into its colors, you'll see something like this kind of blue through red image here. Um, but we, can't, we don't really know what to do with that as scientists because it doesn't have numbers. It's just kind of like an image. So we convert that into numbers. So that's what you see here in the white. So anytime like it looks kind of dark, we make that a low number. And anytime it's really bright, we make it a, a high number. And then we plot that versus what's called the wavelength. So that's the, the length of the um, wavelength of light that we're looking at. So this white plot here is really what the scientists will be looking at. And they're gonna be interpreting something that originally comes in as that kind of image that you see, the colored image. So JWST is gonna search um, this light for the fingerprints of different molecules. And this, these molecules will then tell us how the, how the star stuff got partitioned into different parts of the, of the forming planetary systems. So this is an actual simulated spectrum for JWST for an instrument called um, MIRI. And this is what we think is gonna come from a planet forming region. So on, on the bottom here, you have the wavelength or the, the color of the light. And then um, going upwards, you have the brightness of the light. So now you know how to read this. So you can see anytime there's a spike, that's a little bit extra light. And if there's not a spike, there's um, a little bit less light. And then you can see kind of highlighted all these different molecules, ammonia, methane, acetylene, hydrogen cyanide. 
And then the, the, the really funky thing about these spectra is that everything else pretty much that you see here is due to water vapor. So it turns out water is this really complex molecule and it just kind of emits all these weird peaks of light everywhere. So this is the kind of thing we're expecting to see with JWST. And um, I'm, I do this for a living. And so I really love this phrase, a spectrum is worth a thousand pictures. Um, I know you, you've probably heard a picture is worth a thousand words. So um, I think this is kind of like the next level, right? I mean, I know that it's not as pretty to the eye, but once you know how to look at these, you can figure out so much from these spectra. So what are some of the questions that I can actually answer? So what we're gonna do, again, we're gonna look at these baby solar systems and then we can ask these questions, beer or no beer? Is it there? Where is it if we see it? How hot is it or cold? How much beer is there? And we can ask things like, has it actually been delivered by comets or was it there to begin with? And these sound like kind of silly questions, but if you wanna get into the details, I can explain why these are not actually silly, but these are, you know, if you replace the word beer with C-H-O-N and water, then these are actually the questions we're gonna be asking and answering. All right, so how I am I doing on I like time? that hot, hot beer. That sounds pretty unpleasant. <laughs> All right, how am I doing on time, Cameron? Can, do I have time Oh yeah, you're fine, you're fine. All right. So I want to tell you a little bit about JWST, uh, aside from just my, my personal research projects. Um, so JWST is an all-purpose telescope, so it makes it similar to the Hubble Space Telescope, which is, I think, a lot, one that a lot of people have heard of. But JWST is actually way bigger than HST. So this is a size comparison here. It's, it's a few times bigger in diameter, but the way we collect light really has to do with the area of the mirror. So you kind of get like a nine times better um, collection of light. And it also observe, observes infrared light rather than visible light. And kind of in our, our everyday language, you can think of infrared light as the heat that something gives off, like, you know, the, the heat that your lamp gives off or your, your body gives off um, when, you're, when you're working out or something like that. So in order to um, detect heat, you, JWST itself actually has to be really cold because you don't, JWST doesn't want to detect its own heat because then it's going to get confused. So um, HST was actually essentially at room temperature, but JWST is going to be minus 233 Celsius or minus 388 Fahrenheit. So a totally different ballgame. Um, and how does it do this? Well, it has a giant sun shield. You can see the people here in the lab, so you can get a sense of just how big this is. And um, it's also extremely far from the earth. And this is a kind of a, a image that someone made to demonstrate how different JWST is from Hubble. So they show the Hubble here and JWST here. But if you actually look at the numbers, um, Hubble is 570 kilometers from Earth, and JWST is 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. So this picture is totally not to scale, and I tried to like see if I could make it to scale. It would be something like this, but even more dramatic than this. So, um, so here's Earth and, and HST shrunk down, and then JWST is over there. So JWST is way far out in space, um, totally different from HST. So that keeps it cold as well. Now, the other really interesting thing about GWST is that it's a, um, a 6.5 meter mirror, but you have to fit it essentially into a four meter rocket. Uh, someone asked me today, one of my students asked me, you know, why can't they just make the rocket bigger? So I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if, if Cameron and Sasha know, but for some reason it seems to be cheaper to make a foldable, foldable telescope than it is to make a larger rocket. So um, JWST is essentially, you know, from people of my generation, I think of it as a transformer. So it kind of like folds in on itself. I don't think it turns into any creatures or anything when it's folded up, but it-, it I think it'll I think it make that like, <laughs> wait, 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 when it actually <laughs> transforms as well. I think mm -hmm. they included that. Well, we'll see it in the video. Um, so yeah, so it folds itself up and, and it's gonna go in the rocket and then it has to unfold. And I think 
So I have the link to the video here, but I think Sasha is going to be showing this in his um, presentation that they, they have like a whole unfolding sequence that it has to go through this very nerve wracking thing to watch if you're an astronomer and you've been to real telescopes that are always breaking and people have to climb up into things and fix them. Uh, imagining this thing, it's doing everything correctly out in space with no intervention is, is frightening, but hopefully it works. So fingers crossed for a successful launch. There's kind of this, this really funny cartoon that came out a little while ago. This is um, XKCD. It's like a nerd comic, if you haven't heard of it. And what they did was they actually like plot, plotted the scheduled launch date versus the actual day. And you can see that um, the launch date just kept growing and growing and growing with time. And so they made a prediction that it would launch in 2026. But actually, um, JWST is, was shipped. This is a picture of it being shipped um, to South America, and it has a current launch date of December 18th. So fingers crossed that it's going to go as planned and correctly unfold itself. So that's all I have. I, um, I know I kept the, the talk kind of high level, but I'm happy to geek out. So I'm, I'm interested to hear all your questions. Hooray, excellent presentation. Thank you, Colette. Sure. I'm still haunted by that idea of hot beer though. That's really, really <laughs> Yeah, I know. I was just gonna put cold beer, but then, you know, the reality is that these, these uh, planet forming regions are quite hot, so. <laughs> oh, hello, Sasha, welcome. You're muted. Got to unmute. Okay, you'd think after 18 months of Zooming, I would have figured out how, how to work the mute button, right? <laughs> um, cool. Okay, so uh, audience members, if you have questions for Colette um, about the, you know, her presentation or about J James Webb, we'll also field questions about James Webb in in a bit after Sasha's talk and, and beyond as well. So, um, but let's let's get questions right now for Colette. Um, ooh, I like this. The suggestion that Webb is the, is the love child of the Hubble and Spitzer space telescopes operating like kind of optical, kind of infrared. I like that. Um, I think it's more of an infrared telescope though. Yeah, that's fair. Um, is Hubble gone for good or is there a chance to get it back online to continue operating, you know? For a, long, a much longer period. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing something earlier this week about problems with, with HST. I don't think it's gone forever, but, um, but it's certainly reaching the end of its life. It wasn't, it certainly wasn't expected to last as long as it has. So it's, it's good that James Webb is coming back. Um, Andrew Reitemeyer asks, what is the expected lifetime of James Webb? Oh my gosh, Sasha, do you remember this? I, I want to say it's like a 10 year nominal mission. Yeah, at least five and hopefully 10. There's talk that it, if things go really well, that it could be more. It just depends on how much fuel is actually needed to position itself and the, how much fuel is expended on what's called the, the ride out to L2. Do you but guys five, know, do you know what the predicted lifetime for HST was for the Hubble Space Telescope? I don't know. I think it was on order of sort of 20 years or so, but we're up at what, 30 years now for HST. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, but JWC does have a hard limit of just, it's just to run out of fuel at some point. Yeah. Right, because HST is just in a passive orbit, whereas with James Webb, it's sitting out at L2, but it has to expend energy to stay in that orbit around L2, right? That's right. Yeah, I think it like, the other thing, you know, is that is it kind of gets messed up every time it it actually slews to things. So you you do actually use a little bit of fuel just slewing around. And I know, um, you know, most of the instruments aboard like NearCam and NearSpec are just like passively cooled by sitting out there and having the heat shield block stuff. But MIRI, which operates in like farther wavelengths, I think it does need cryo coolant, kind of like Spitzer had two different observing modes. Like there was the far infrared mm. that really needed the coolant in order to to, to make sure it was su super cryo, but then it had like kind of mid-level that didn't need to be cooled. So I, I don't know how that affects its lifetime too. So maybe some of the instruments will continue to work for a longer period. But if it's, as you guys are describing, like if it is truly limited by being able to stay in its orbit, then yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've heard it's just the fuel. So I don't know if the cryogen just has, there's much more cryogen or if it just is a recycle 
a recycled coolant. I see. Okay. Yep. Okay. Ah. Uh, Ananda Ganguly asks, since comets are rocky and Earth is rocky, why? what could be the reason that comets carry lots of water, but Earth doesn't? Oh, comets are, are, are icy. Yeah, they're sometimes called, what are they called? Like dirty snowballs. Dirty snowballs. Yeah, but, the, but people, yeah, I'm trying to remember what people call them. There's like a reverse way to call it. Um, I think, you know, you should really think of them as, as pretty icy. So they, yeah, it's, it's thought that they formed farther from the sun. So they were able to hold on to their ice and then they had to get kicked in by Jupiter. Uh, Bill Wicks asks, are there any temperature requirements for the telescope? Is it protected from solar flares? Hmm. Uh, well, I think maybe Colette said this, but the telescope always has its sort of back, if you will, its telescope back to the sun. So I think it's relatively, the instruments are relatively protected from things like high energy particles from the from the sun. But that I think after time that can degrade the sun shield a little bit. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, Cynthia Kaiser asks, why is James Webb going to be so far from Earth? You know, Hubble was just hanging out in in near Earth orbit. So why are we sending this so so far away? I think the main reason is to keep it as cool as possible, um, and it's also uh, it's it, it's it needs to be in a very stable environment. Actually, one of the things that Hubble suffers from as being in this ninety-minute orbit around the Earth is that the temperature changes; it goes up and down as it as it comes in and out of view of the sun. So actually, you can see these cycles very clearly in HST and in, in Hubble. But with James Webb, it will be very stable in a sort of uniform uh, temperature, if you will, when it's that far out. Yeah, one thing that I kind of wondered about, I wonder if I can show this. Are you still able to see my slides? No, I, I closed that down so we can oh, okay. see all of us. But go ahead and share your screen again if you'd like. Um, it's okay, I can just describe it. <laughs> so I what I what I remember hearing is that, so I had asked, you know, if, if you want JWC to stay cool, could you just like kind of hide it behind the earth, like in earth's shadow? Because that's kind of where it is in space. It's kind of behind the earth relative to the sun. And what they told me was that actually that's a bad idea because it because as Sasha was saying, it makes it unstable kind of because it might go in and out of the shadow and then it kind of won't be stable. So what it does is it actually kind of like orbits around the shadow so that it kind of maintains the same amount of sunlight. So it actually doesn't want to be shielded from sunlight. It wants to kind of like always have the same amount of sunlight and the sunlight also powers the instruments. Yeah, that's true. You have to continue to power the thing while keeping everything cool simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. a real balancing act. Um, Bad Brain Biddle asks, where does the, the water and the ice uh, that comets have, where does that actually come from? Yeah, so this is like a whole part of the story that I kind of skipped. But what we think is that originally the the planetary system, everything is everywhere. So all the whole planetary system has the same composition essentially as the sun to start with. And then what happens is that given a certain temperature, some of the stuff becomes solid and some of it is gas. And the solid can collect into something like a comet or an earth, um, but anything that's gas is gonna blow away. And so if you're close to the sun, the only things that are solids are rocks and metals. And if you're far from the sun, you can actually get ice also in, or water, things like water in solid form. So that's why if you're really far from the sun, you can form, your, form a composition that includes water ice. If you're close to the sun, you don't have water. I see, okay. Do we, you know, Going on the question that I had from before and the question that you you presented to the audience in your presentation, um, like whether or not the Earth is it has water that's outgassing or something like that, or if it's been bombarded by comets, is there any evidence for for like water that, you know, I guess the the migration of the Earth from the outer solar system where there would have been more water and ice present to, to the inner solar system at time? Or do we not have really good constraints on 
the migration. Yeah, I mean, we, we have some constraints on what happened in the solar system. So unlike other extrasolar planetary systems, the, the solar system did not have really large amounts of, of movement of the planets. They had a little bit. So like we think that Jupiter and Saturn actually moved outwards a little bit. Um, but for the most part, you know, the solar system relative to other planetary systems was pretty much more stable. So we don't think the Earth migrated any significant distance. I see. Okay. Okay. Uh, cool. Um, okay. We, well, one last, one last question that's related to James Webb that maybe I actually don't know the answer to, um, but maybe we can assemble a response to. Um, E.H. asks, how do you compensate for the obstruction of the bracket holding the James Webb outer mirror? Doesn't that block a large area of the light? Or a large amount of the light because you've got the you've got the primary mirror and then you've got I guess the brackets connecting to the secondary doesn't that block a bunch of the light I think it just does and we just deal with it right I mean that's what Sasha does right <laughs> is deal with it yeah actually we have the same problem with ground-based telescopes where we have the support struts that hold the secondary mirror and that all of that architecture just goes into the overall shape of the pupil if you will. Um, and that's just basically calibrated when we receive an image of a point source, all that geometry of the pupil gets folded into the final image. And it turns out that, yeah, you're right, a little bit of light is blocked and it would be nice if we didn't have to block that at all, but you gotta have a secondary mirror somehow to get the light back into the instrument. So that's just something we have to live with. But one thing we've really learned in the last few years is that really careful calibration of that image uh, of, uh, of, a, of a point source, actually, careful calibration can really lead to the deep observations that I'm going to talk about in my talk. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Cool. Uh, I think that's the bulk of the questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Colette. That was sure. wonderful. Um, I'm excited to learn the origin of, of beer when James Webb finally launches. <laughs> so, so thank you. Just not hot beer. That just sounds very unpleasant. Very <laughs> Um, cool. Okay. Uh, so Sasha, welcome. Sasha is in, is in the UK right now. So it's like 4.07 AM for you. Is that true? That is true, but I promise you I'm not in my pajamas. Well, it's okay. Well, yeah, maybe you are. I can't really tell, but that's fine. If you are, I'm almost, oh, I'm almost in mine. So, um, Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us from across the the sea. It's great um, to be here. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to hear your talk as well. Uh, let's see. Dr. Sasha Hinckley is a professor at the University of Exeter in the UK and works on the direct imaging of exoplanets. Sasha has been one of the builders of some of the instruments that are used for exoplanets from the ground at, for instance, Palomar Observatory. Um, one of the major observatories just to the south of Los Angeles that was the largest telescope in the world for 30 odd years or so, yeah. um, and still remains like a powerful telescope that's used for a lot of cutting edge research. And most recently, um, he has been organizing the exoplanet direct imaging community to obtain some of the first images of exoplanets with the James Webb Space Tele Telescope. Um, I went to graduate school with Sasha many years ago in New York City, and um, and it's been a long time since I've seen you, old friend. So I'm glad to have you aboard, even though it's 4 a.m. for you. Um, I don't expect you're drinking beer at 4 a.m. I suppose. No, that's... not yet. <laughs> yes. um, cool. Well, I'll uh, I'll let you take it away. All right. Let me see if I can remember how to share my screen here. Um, can you see yes. my slides? I, I can see them. Looks great. 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 And everybody can hear me okay. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for the nice introduction, Cameron. It's really awesome to be here, actually. I've known about astronomy on tap for a, a long time, and I it's really great to finally be able to sort of talk to you about um, uh, what I call seeing exoplanets in a whole new light with JWST. And Colette gave a really nice introduction to uh, uh, JWST. I'm going to be talking a lot, a little bit more about the about the observatory itself. So if you're curious about the telescope and things like that, um, stay tuned. But what I want to do is I want to just talk really generally about how we sort of detect exoplanets at all. And a lot of this may be familiar to a lot of you. Um, but first, just to give a little bit of context, 
This is a movie that was produced by some of my friends at the American Museum of Natural History. This is our nearby uh, environment. You can see our sun is at the center uh, of, of this imaginary red sphere here. And this is really our solar neighborhood here. So you can see the background of the, of the Milky Way as we sort of rotate around. And the really interesting thing about this, uh, about this simulation, it's, it's physically correct. So the positions of the stars are, are, are correct based on the astrometry of the stars that we, we know. Each of the stars that have the little purple circle around them uh, is a star that hosts an exoplanet. So I hope this uh, tells you that most stars have exoplanets. And that's something that we've actually, uh, that's very clear to us now. Missions like the Kepler uh, mission uh, and, and really ongoing radial velocity surveys that look for the wobble of stars, which I'll talk about in a moment, have really verified that most stars have planets and planets are really common. I should say also that this video is probably five to 10 years old now. And so if we were to make an updated version of this movie, almost all the stars uh, in, the, in here, in this movie that you can see would have planets around them. So this is a real opportunity to really study planets, not only in our, our nearby solar neighborhood, but, but maybe even a bit farther. So just very quickly to review, I wanna talk a little bit about how we sort of discover exoplanets. Maybe the, one of the most prolific methods is the so-called Doppler method, where we actually infer the presence of a planet that's orbiting around its star by measuring very precisely the wobble, if you will, of the host star, which you can see here. So I wanna emphasize that this is an indirect method. We don't actually see what we kind of would see in this little movie that I'm showing here, but we actually just infer the presence of this planet orbiting around its star just based on the wobble that it causes. Maybe the most sort of prolific method of all is the so-called transit method where we see a planet passing in front of its host star, which creates a little bit of a depletion in the brightness, a little bit of a dip in the brightness, as you can see from this little graph at the bottom of this uh, slide here. And this has allowed us to detect literally thousands of extrasolar planets orbiting nearby stars. So these two first two methods I really want to emphasize are really indirect methods. We don't see the planet actually, but we only infer its presence. But there's kind of a new, um, and I should say also that, that these two techniques are responsible really for the lion's share of the exoplanet discoveries over the last 20 years or so. So this is actually getting to be an old plot now, but going up to 2016, this shows the number of exoplanet detections as a function of year. And uh, the, 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 the little lower red bars here are the radial velocity discoveries, the wobble method, and the green ones are the, actually the transiting methods. So you can see that those have really been responsible for the, the vast majority of the discoveries. But there's kind of a new technique on the block, if you will, and this is called direct imaging of exoplanets. And this is really the technique that's uh, true to my heart uh, because it really allows us to actually take an image of a nearby solar system, to take a picture of the local environment around a nearby star and look for things like planets, disks, etc. So here's three examples of some really famous systems, uh, Beta Pictoris B, PDS7DB, and uh, my favorite at the bottom, which is HR8799. This system at the bottom is a four planet system. This is a fairly nearby system, about 40 parsecs or so. And it's really remarkable that it has four planets orbiting it. And I'll, I'll show you that in, in a moment that we've now seen these, these planets moving, orbiting around their star in the way that we would expect. So in each of these images, the star is actually at the center of the image. And what we do is we actually use a occulting mask to block out the host star's very bright light. And that allows us to see very faint things in orbit around the, the star. It's kind of as if you were to take your thumb, put it up to a, you know, the sun in, in, in the daylight and block out the sun. Probably not a good idea to do that. So please don't try that at home. But yeah, this, this technique uh, allows us to actually directly image extrasolar planets. And most of these images, all these images that I'm showing here were actually taken from the ground. But what I'm gonna tell you a little bit about is how we're gonna actually do that, take pictures of exoplanets at totally new wavelengths using the James Webb Space Telescope. So yeah, I told you a moment ago that we have these images of, of these planetary systems, and this is my favorite, HR8799. And I like this movie but it, because it compiles 10 years of data 
into this little movie and we can actually see the planets orbiting around their star in the way that we would expect. The closer planets move faster as we would expect and these wide separation planets all the way out here move much slower. So I think this is truly amazing just through these technological advan advances that we've had in the last sort of 10 to 15 years that we can actually watch the evolution of planetary systems uh, from here on Earth. I think this is really cool. It's worth noting that most of these planets that we study are nothing like uh, Earth-like planets. These are super Jupiter type planets. These are several times the mass of Jupiter. In this case, these planets are probably kind of five to seven times the mass of Jupiter, but they're on these incredibly wide orbits. At the bottom of this slide here, I've got a little bar that says 20 AU, and that's 20 times the Earth-Sun Earth distance, 20 astronomical units. So these planets are that we're seeing in this little movie here are far beyond the orbit of Jupiter and are more on the orbits of sort of our own Neptune or even Pluto. So it's interesting to think about how these massive planets formed on these really wide separation orbits in the first place or got there. So why hasn't this been done, you know, 30, 40 years ago or something? And the answer is that it's really, really, really hard to do these measurements, to actually take pictures of planets. And there's a couple of challenges that I wanna just tell you about that make this really, really hard. The first one is the separation of the planet from the star on the sky. Okay, that maybe makes sense. So here's an image of a nearby star actually taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And what uh, we've done here is we've basically photoshopped in the orbit of an Earth and a Jupiter if it were in orbit around this star. So we've got the Earth with this little one astronomical unit orbit and a Jupiter with a five astronomical unit orbit at five AU there. So these are really, really close to their star. And the question is how close? Well, at the bottom of this, of this slide, I have one arc second. And one arc second is an angle that you would measure on the sky. And to give you a sense of how small one arc second is, uh, this is actually the size of a dime at one mile. So most of these planets are much, much less than uh, an arc second in, in angle on the sky, if you will. So this is a really, really challenging measurement to make because these planets uh, are really, really close to their star, but also these planets are much, much, much fainter than their host star. Typically these planets are 10,000 to a million times fainter than their host star. So these, these two things kind of combine into this single problem of contrast that we have to overcome. Really, really close separation from the host star, many, many orders of magnitude of brightness difference. So if just to give you a sense of how challenging this is, uh, I was thinking earlier about, um, so Cameron is in Los Angeles, and I was thinking about uh, what, how can we put this challenge into sort of human terms? Well, imaging, if we were to image a Jupiter-like planet, uh, like in our solar system, that's orbiting a nearby star, uh, let's say Cameron was trying to do this from Los Angeles. So orbiting a Jupiter, orbiting a nearby star from Los Angeles, it turns out it's pretty similar to imaging a firefly if it were crawling around the rim of a searchlight. Uh, and I actually looked this up. I looked up the brightness of a firefly compared to the brightness of one of these early sort of World War II era searchlights shown here. And the brightness is actually fairly comparable between a, a very faint planet sort of orbiting around its star uh, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a firefly would be relative to the searchlight. The only caveat here is that you would need to put this searchlight in San Francisco. So that's the kind of uh, rough orders of magnitude that we're talking about. So imagine sitting in your, in your uh, house in Los Angeles, trying to take a picture of a firefly crawling around the edge of a searchlight if that searchlight were in San Francisco. So that's the kind of challenge that we face uh, in the work that I do. Um, that is outrageous. That is crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's crazy, but it's the truth. <laughs> so these are the kinds of challenges that we do and the kind of technological challenges that we have to sort of overcome. So to do this, we can take advantage of um, basically physics. And it turns out that these planets that we are talking about actually are a little bit brighter in the mid-infrared. 
And when I say mid-infrared, I mean uh, wavelengths sort of beyond about two microns or so. So this is already way out of the, the range that our eye can see. And this is starting to get into the range where JWST will be sensitive. So this is an image that I like a lot. This is an image of Jupiter, but uh, taken at five microns, actually. And actually, planets like Jupiter tend to be much, much brighter at these wavelengths just because of they're actually cooler and, and, the, and the light tends to be more concentrated at these longer wavelengths. So that's where JWST can, can, can make a huge contribution. But you might say, well, well, haven't we been doing this from the years from the ground? Well, we've been trying to image these uh, exoplanets from the ground at these really, really optimal wavelengths like mid-infrared. And here's a couple of examples uh, of some friends of mine that have tried to, uh, from the friends of mine that have tried to take pictures of these planets in the mid-infrared. And you can see that the, the, the images that have been obtained are, you, there's some detections here if you look at the little arrows of the planets, but it's really challenging. And these detections are really, really marginal. And the sole reason for this is because the Earth's atmosphere just provides a huge amount of just infrared background that we would have to overcome. If you didn't have eyes that worked in the sort of visible range, but worked in the sort of range of three, four, five microns, uh, longer wavelengths, the actual, the entire night sky would just be appear to be glowing to you. It would appear like a bright sky to you, uh, even if it were nighttime. And that's just because the atmosphere itself um, has an intrinsic glow to it, if you will, at these infrared wavelengths. And so what we really would like to do is we'd like to put a six meter telescope in space to actually study planets at these wavelengths and get out of this incredibly bright atmosphere, this sort of telluric uh, atmosphere uh, to, to image these planets. So Colette gave a really nice introduction to the James Webb Space Telescope, and that's exactly what James Webb is going to do. It's going to get us out into space where all of these wavelengths are much, much more uh, uh, accessible to us. So James Webb is going to have, among almost everything else, an incredible level of sensitivity. It's going to be something like uh, 500 times more sensitive than some of the most powerful instruments working at these wavelengths at observatories like Keck on hot, on on uh, the island of Hawaii on the Mauna Kea volcano. So, and that's just again due to this very, very cold environment in space, totally free of atmosphere from the Earth that allows these observations to happen. So, James Webb is going to, is obviously a much more technologically complicated instrument, as I'll tell you in a moment. It's about the size of a tennis court when the, the sun shield here. I think you can see this little human being at the bottom of the, of the slide here. Um, so it's, it's both a huge challenge, but also um, a tremendous opportunity that we've never, ever seen before. So here's the mirror that was uh, back when it was uh, in one of the labs. There's a person actually at the top of this slide sitting on one of these little cherry pickers uh, in, a, in a bunny suit. So that gives you a sense for the actual primary mirror of James Webb. And I'll show you some more uh, images of this uh, in a moment. So this is incredibly exciting that we're 40 days from launch and JWST is actually going to directly image exoplanets at totally new wavelengths, at these wavelengths I just talked about a few minutes ago in the mid and what we might call the far infrared or thermal infrared. And this is an example of one of the exoplanets that we're going to directly image. This is HIP 65426B. This is one of my favorite exoplanets around. This was actually discovered using a, a ground-based telescope, uh, the very large telescope uh, in, in Chile. And the discovery image is shown here on this left panel over here. And the arrow I've got here is actually just the location of the host star where it's been blocked out using one of these occulting masks, which is called a coronagraph. And you can see this planet uh, here, uh, sort of at the lower left, uh, which is uh, noted B here. And this was taken at this this image here was taken at sort of one micron or so, just still outside the wavelengths where our eyes can see. But what J James Webb is going to do actually is image these planets at wavelengths that we've never ever seen exoplanets, four microns and even fifteen microns. These are w wavelengths far into the infrared, and we have no idea what exoplanets are going to look like 
or what the brightness of these planets are going to be at these wavelengths. So this is totally this is going to be totally transformative. And one of the things that I've been spending a lot of my time on in the last few years is getting my community organized to do these observations with James Webb. There's another system that we're actually going to be imaging. This is called VHS 1256B. Uh, this is a sort of a snapshot of images uh, taken from the ground. These are the discovery images actually here at uh, one micron or 1000 nanometers if you prefer to think like that and going all the way out here to just over two microns and you can see the host star here. This is a faint uh, sort of M dwarf star and you can see this planet uh, in orbit around it and you can see the planet actually get, be getting brighter and brighter relative to the host star and that's actually more and more advantageous because as I mentioned earlier these planets are getting brighter and brighter as we move into these James Webb type wavelengths. So this is a planetary mass companion, or could be more of a sort of a brown dwarf type of thing, but it's at 100 astronomical units. So it's, a, it's at 100 times our Earth-Sun distance. And we're actually really excited about this because we're actually going to get the first ever spectroscopy, like Colette talked about. We're going to get the first ever spectroscopy of this object, uh, covering really the full luminous range of this object, at all, covering all the wavelengths at which this thing emits. So we've never seen anything like this before, and it's, per it's particularly exciting because we're going to be able to just study the compositions of its atmosphere, uh, look for things like totally new types of clouds, clouds made of silicate materials, um, and, and things like that. So this is going to be particularly exciting going forward, and James Webb has a unique set of instruments to do all these different measurements at different wavelengths, to do images, to do spectroscopy, and I can talk to you more about that if you're curious. But I want the sort of the last few minutes of my talk, I want to talk about just the incredible challenges uh, of completing JWST that this has, has required. Um, this is a truly international effort involving the United States, Canada, and uh, many, many European uh, countries. And the technological challenges of this have just been immense. And one of the things that I like to talk about is this has moved all over the country. It started at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, it went down to the Johnson Space Center in Houston for uh, cryogenic testing. And for the last several years, it's been actually out in Los Angeles uh, at Northrop Grumman for, for additional testing. And just moving the James Webb Space Telescope from these different places was a huge logistical challenge. Uh, it had to require uh, the US Air Force's largest uh, airplane, the C-5 Galaxy, uh, this is the largest airplane in the in the Air Force fleet. This is typically used to move for heat, like humanitarian evacuations, for example, humanitarian efforts, uh, or moving um, you know, large things like tanks, say. So this is the kind of aircraft that's needed to move the James Webb Space Telescope. And here it is actually being loaded into the uh, uh, Galaxy C5 aircraft using uh, a, an 18-wheeler. Uh, in my country, we would call this a lorry. Uh, and I just, I like this picture because it sort of conveys the immense challenge of getting this actually, uh, uh, this thing done. There was a movie that was actually produced by the Goddard Space Flight Center that I just want to show you here. This is the James Webb Space Telescope basically when it was done and ready to be packed up. And it has this customized shipping container that you can see it going into here, putting the lid on this, this customized shipping container. It's very, very clean completely free from uh, contamination and, and, and sealed shut. So here it is being rolled out in the middle of the night from Northrop Grumman in Los Angeles and driving down the street in the middle of the night in Los Angeles. And for those of you that are familiar with Los Angeles traffic, they had to do this in the middle of the night to uh, avoid uh, rush hour traffic. So here it is being loaded onto the freeway, going up and off ramp, and it's moving in the slow lane, which is which is good news. Um, I probably qualified for the carpool lane, but you know this was like three in the morning, so why not just use the slow lane and back up traffic, especially when you have a huge police escort like this. So this was actually moved from Northrop Grumman to a, a basically a harbor, Seal Beach Harbor in Los Angeles. Um, where it was actually uh, loaded onto uh, the boat. The Colette showed a nice picture of the boat. Um, all of this happened uh, last month. Uh, this was a huge effort uh, just involving so many people and it's great that it actually uh, arrived 
uh, safely. Here's uh, an image uh, of, of the boat actually arriving Kourou, French Guiana, uh, just actually a few days ago. And it's on track for a launch in about 40 days, which is, which is uh, truly incredible. So in the last few minutes of my talk, I want to just show uh, a visualization uh, of JWST in the first sort of uh, couple months of its lifetime. And this, was an, this is an amazing visualization made by uh, the, the visualization team at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Uh, so I want to give a huge shout out to Micah Asinapura and also Carter Emmert, who have been uh, responsible for using this software called OpenSpace to generate this uh, movie. And I think what I need to do here is actually switch. And um, let's see, let me do a share, um, I think here. And can you see yeah. this movie? Okay, Cameron. Yes. Looks great. Cool. So this is a visualization of the James Webb Space Telescope just a couple of minutes after it was launched from the Ariane Space, uh, five, the Ariane 5 rocket. You can see the Earth in the background here. And just like the visualization I showed you before, all of the positions of the stars uh, and the features of the Earth are geographically and astrometrically accurate. So what I like about this visualization is that red trail going around the Earth is actually the orbit of the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is actually just in the first sort of uh, first day of the orbit where we actually see the deployment of the solar array uh, happening there. And we're going to speed up in time here a little bit. You can see the orbit of the Hubble Space Telescope going a little bit faster, which just means we're, we're, zoom we're fast forwarding in time a little bit. And what a couple things that happen in the first day of the orbit is the deployment, uh, the first day of the mission, I should say, is the is the deployment not only of the solar array, but also of the communications antenna. So it's really important for James Webb to get power right away, but also to be able to communicate. So in the first week, now we're up to about the first week of the mission, we are start to see the deployment of the sun shield, and we see the deployment of the first sun shield pallet uh, start to unfold. Uh, these don't unfold simultaneously. We do one first and then the other. So these pallets basically fold down. These are flat. Keep in mind these are, you know, length of uh, on the order of a tennis court or so. Uh, the next step, uh, sort of in this first week or so, is that we'll start to see the deployment of what we call the mid-booms. These are these sort of uh, sticks that will come out kind of perpendicular from these initial pallets. And that's actually what will be used to actually deploy the sun shield. So all of this needs to happen in the first week to get the sun shield uh, deployed so that the, the observatory can start cooling as, as early as possible in the mission to make sure that the instruments get down to their, their coldest possible uh, temperature. This is super cool, Sash. Well, it's thank the American Museum of Natural History visualization team. So I really can't take any credit for this. Uh, this it's an amazing team there. I just well, feel good. lucky to be yeah. able to show this to you guys. Yeah, I know Carter's awesome. I, I don't know um, Micah. But... Micah, yeah. So keep in mind, all the images of the stars in the background and the galaxy are, are accurate. So here come the mid-booms. These are the uh, things that are going to help deploy the sun shield here. And everything that we've uh, been seeing here is happening in the first week of the mission. So first we see one mid-boom come out and another mid-boom come out. And then the last step of the, of, the, of the sun shield deployment is actually what they call tensioning. And that's just, uh, uh, just getting the, the sun shield membranes tension. There's, there's several membranes. I think it's five different layers. Uh, uh, each one is cooler than the next. Uh, so the coolest one obviously is closest to the mirror and the instruments, and the hottest one, if you will, is is on the on the back side of the instruments of the back side of the whole observatory. So in the first month, now we're kind of in the first month of the mission, we start to see the secondary mirror start to deploy, and those big arms sort of falling into place there, which are the the struts that hold the secondary mirror uh, in place. And as soon as that's in place, then you'll actually start to see the deployment of the of the primary mirror. So we see these two side wings of the mirror that are still folded in. I should have said, of course, that James Webb is a, a segmented mirror. That's the only way that we could get this observatory to actually fold up and fit into a rocket. 
so there's no hope of doing a full six meter mirror. You would need a, a, a rocket that's fully six meters uh, uh, wide and we don't have that. So we have a slightly folding mirror here and these two wings you can see are sort of folding in to make the full uh, hexagonal shape, sort of that honeycomb shape uh, that we, we see here. So this, the deployment of the primary ear mirror should hopefully happen by the end of the first month. And then we just sort of start this long process of several weeks of cooling down the, temp the, the observatory to the operating temperature. One thing that I thought was interesting, and here's our, here's our beast fully assembled. One of the things that I thought was really interesting is that uh, a huge problem will be trapped gases, trapped air bubbles inside the sun shield. Uh, and those need to be actually released very carefully. And if they were to just sort of release these immediately, it could cause damage to that to the actual uh, sun shield. So in addition to that, it actually requires heaters so that this this that any moisture in there doesn't immediately freeze. So there's a very complicated system of actually heating the telescope. That sounds counterintuitive to let the gas out. So one of the things that in this simulation is is the system that we're going to observe actually is HIP six five four two six. So this is a zoom in of this system that I mentioned. This is the first system where I mentioned we're going to get images of this extrasolar planet at 15 microns. So now we're zooming in on this solar system. You can see the orbit of the planet by that purple trajectory there out at like 100 astronomical units or so, 100 times our Earth's sun distance. And that little tiny circle that we're going to zoom in now is actually the orbit of our Earth if it were there. And the green sort of donut shaped thing is actually the habitable zone of the, for this star. Each star has its magic, its own magical Goldilocks zone that's suitable for liquid water to, to, to exist in. And this star actually you might have seen is a little bit further, for this star the habitable zone is a little bit further out uh, than our own Earth would be. So and that's just because this, this star is actually hotter, so its habitable zone moves outward a little bit. So that hopefully just gives you a little bit of scale of the planets that we're going to look at. They're nothing like Earth at all. There are these incredibly wide separation planets on the order of like 100 astronomical units or so. But nonetheless, they're, they're extremely interesting for studying from a purely scientific point of view to understand what their compositions are like, which might give you a glimpse on their formation mechanism and things like that. So I'll stop the movie there, and I'll, I guess I'll take any questions if people, people have them. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Great presentation. Thank you very much. That video was really incredible, too. Uh, thank you to Carter and, and Micah from the Museum of American Museum of Natural History for, for contributing that. But yeah, you're, you're remarkably like cogent, given that you're, it's 4.30 a.m. for you. I, I don't expect to be in that kind of condition in, in like six hours from now. So. <laughs> well, I've got three small children, so I'm used to being woken up at all kinds of hours. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, feel free to mark them in the um, in the chat associated with this stream. There's a few questions already. Does the size so Buddha's palm, nice username. Does the size of the star influence the size of the planet proportionally, or is there some sort of nonlinear relationship between the size of a star and the size of its planet? What we we think that there's a trend that more massive stars might be better at producing more massive planets, the kind of planets that I'm interested in studying. There's tentative evidence for that, although it's debated. The idea is that, or a proposed mechanism for this, is that a massive star probably came from a, a, a environment, a circumstellar disk like Colette talked about, uh, that was also very massive. So a lot of the available, there were a lot of available building blocks for building massive planets. So it might be that really massive planets go hand in hand with massive stars, but the jury's still out a little bit on that. But there's not just like a proportionality thing, like small star, small planet, and then everything increases by a factor of 10 or something like that. Not that we know of. Um, if anything, what, one of the things we've learned just in the last few years is that small planets are incredibly common. And they seem to be uh, especially common around sort of solar type stars. So the most common type of planets are sort of these super Earth things or mini Neptunes. We're not quite sure what if they're more like super Earths or mini Neptunes, but they're they're incredibly common. Cool, cool. Uh, Andrew Reitemeyer asks: Would 
will JWST be able to detect exoplanet candidates in other galaxies, like the one that was just purportedly found in, uh, in, in Messier Object 51, in the galaxy M51? Um, we, we certainly won't have the resolution to actually directly image them at those distances. Uh, maybe if we were lucky and we got a huge amount of observing time with, with JWST, we could sit and look for a transiting planet at those, at those super distances. But I think it's hopeless with, even with James Webb to be able to actually physically resolve a planet at that kind of distance. It's just too, too far away, too small angular size. Too far away. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how detailed are the exoplanet images going to be taken? Are we going to be able to see continents and trees on these exoplanets, or is it just like a pixel in your image? Sadly not. Sadly, we're not going to be able to see oceans and continents yet. Uh, but the, the, the advantage of James Webb is that it has a huge range of wavelengths that it's sensitive to. It's got a huge number of filters. So what we can do is we can take lots and lots of images at slightly different wavelengths and we can sort of get a sense for what the shape of its, of its spectrum might be, like Colette uh, mentioned. So although we can't resolve features on the planets, we can get a huge amount of information about its compositions, about its, uh, about its chemical abundances uh, using spectroscopy like Colette talked about, and I think that's uh, equally powerful. Indeed. Uh, there was a question. Can we identify moons of exoplanets in the Milky Way or other galaxies? So this is debated. Um, there's been some reports of exomoons in the, in the literature. It's extremely challenging to do this. Uh, people have, have I think done this photometrically looking for evidence of, of planet of, of moons. Uh, but we've also even around some of these massive directly imaged, I wouldn't call them planets, but I might call them brown dwarf companions. There's evidence for uh, possibly additional things. My postdoc Cecilia Lazzoni, who's working with me, has uncovered evidence of a possible companion to a companion, if you will. Uh, so I think this is a really exciting frontier because it's, it's, it's potentially going to pose a lot of questions for our, our sort of theories of these formations of these objects. Was Cecilia able to do that in direct imaging or is that through, because it seems like with radio velocity technique, you might be able to see the, the, the periodicity of that in, in the waveform of the, 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 uh, the star itself, but it seems harder to do. I mean, I don't know. I would assume that it seems harder to do in direct imaging. It is hard to do in direct imaging, but <clears throat> if we have a bright star and we've got something next to it that might be a brown dwarf or even a planet, <laughs> If that doesn't look exactly like a point source, if it might have a little bump on one edge, that could be indicative of a companion to this companion, if you will. So we don't, we, it's, it's impossible to sort of resolve that companion, but we see sort of departures from a perfect point source, if you will. I see. Okay. Cool. Uh, well, excellent talk. Uh, to, to both of you guys. Thank you very much, both of you, for taking your time to to join us. Um, people are, are welcome to, to suggest other questions, but for now, I think it's time to go into the pub trivia section of the evening. Um, I suppose it's still too early for you, for you, Sasha, but I have a beer called Mirror Lair, which seems appropriate given the mirrors of James Webb, uh, which are allowing us to do all of this crazy science. Um, so, I'm going to move to the pub trivia section of this. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Uh, so for our audience, what that means is you are encouraged to stick around and we will have an interactive means for you to take part in this pub trivia. Um, okay, can you guys see my screen, this astronomy on tap screen? Okay, so what that means is audience members this is gonna be pub trivia. Uh, you are encouraged to participate. You can do so by going to this website in a browser or on your phone, uh, menti.com. And then you type in this number that's specific to this particular, um, this instance. Because menti.com works for everybody who has an account there and can do these sort of interactive things. When you answer your question into that website, um, it'll show up 
here on our shared screen so we can see how what you guys are guessing to the answers of these things. Um, and yeah, Sasha and Colette, I encourage you guys to participate too. Although you can just like shout out your answers here. Although maybe wait for the audience to, to, to give their answers so you don't spoil the fun in case you know the answers, which you may know and you may not know. Some of these are hard. I wouldn't probably have known them. I sound like a genius. I always know the answers because I wrote the questions. See, that's the trick. It's like Alex Trebek. Everybody thinks Alex Trebek's a genius or was a genius, but who knows? He could have just been a dunce who was just writing all the questions. That's the trick, that's the trick. So here we go. Adjusted for inflation, what has been the cost of building the James Webb Space Telescope? Leave it to, leave it to our audience here, what they think it might be. Oh, 600 million, good, good guesses. Good start out here. Um, yeah, so just for reference, I mean, we'll just yammer on while we're waiting for people to respond. So James Webb is the final telescope in the great observatories of NASA. NASA put forth these great observatories. I think the first one was in the 80s, Compton. And there, it was a series of different observatories that were uh, operating in different wavelengths of light. So there was... Um, Hubble is one of them. Chandra is in the X-ray part of the spectrum. Compton is in the gamma rays. Uh, Spitzer was in the, the infrared. What else am I missing, guys? Are there other major ones? James Webb was, now is... Was Herschel one of them? Uh, maybe. I don't think so. I think Herschel was more of a European thing. You said Hubble, right? Cameron? Yeah, Hubble, okay. Hubble, Compton, Chandra, Spitzer, James... Oh, wow, we've got lots of answers here. 10 billion, 15 billion, 8 billion, 600 million, 90, 97 billion. Whew. Whew. One with a lot of zeros after it. 5 billion, $1 billion, Dr. Evil. Um, what do you guys think? Colette, Sash? I, I think of it as 10 billion is what I heard. Mm. Me too. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, oh, I put 11. So I counted up. I went I went in a, on a deep dive here. And so... The construction costs from America were about 10 million, or I'm sorry, 10 billion. But then there was about a billion if you add in the Canadian contribution and mm. the European Space Agency contribution. But then there's going to be more for the operation costs that actually equal like another billion or so for the next, for the first five years that it's like necessarily going to exist. This uh, image shows a timeline of the funding that goes towards NASA astrophysics in black. And then the funding that went towards JW uh, in blue. And you can see that half the entire NASA astrophysics budget for a, you know, almost a decade was just going toward the construction of James Webb, which meant that basically NASA astrophysics couldn't do a lot of other things throughout, you know, the last decade because so much money was going towards James Webb. So uh, in some ways, it'll be really nice now that we're down here and the maintenance costs are much less than the construction cost of James Webb. And so NASA will be able to afford to build other astrophysics things or, you know, fund us astrophysicists uh, in, in grants and that sort of thing instead of just um, building costs. So. Did so you I, make that plot, Cameron? I did not. I did not make this plot. I found this plot. But, but as comparison, I did learn, and this was kind of surprising, Hubble Space Telescope, it's, do you guys have any idea? I didn't. Um, what its construction cost was uh, inflated to current to current levels. Like in 1990, Hubble launched, and it had taken you know a decade plus to build Hubble and launch it and everything. And it it actually. Do you guys have any idea? Because I didn't. What it cost in today's I'm dollars? I'm going with 11 billion because it says that. <laughs> it was like three billion to construct, but then over the course of the last 30 years, in terms of maintenance. It's much more. It's more than 11 billion. So HST has cost on par. You know, we always like, oh God, JW is so over budget. It's cost so much money. Well, it's not that much more than HST has cost over a substantial amount of time. So, you know, uh, and HST has arguably been the most important, certainly astronomical instrument, but maybe scientific instrument for the field. So it's, uh, I don't know. I'm excited to see what JW can do. 
So one thing I just tried to calculate real quick was, um, cause I've heard this for other telescopes I've used, but like, what is the cost per hour? Because when we're astronomers, we use the telescope and we make mm -hmm. a mistake and it's like, well, that was like a, oh. a $10,000 mistake right there. <laughs> so I just tried to calculate what is the cost per hour on James Webb. So I took the 10 billion, I divided by the number of hours over 10 years and I get a hundred and around $110,000 an hour. <laughs> Per hour, hundred, yeah, that sounds yeah. About right. So, so we got to not mess up, me and Sasha. Yeah, don't, don't, do right. don't, <laughs> don't make mistakes in your pointing or, or what your choice is. Um, cool. Uh, people have already started answering uh, the second question. One thing that I'll note to our audience members: um, there's no prize. I wish I could give you a prize. If this were in person, I would give you a prize. There's no prize except knowledge. So, I encourage people, despite the fact that you have literally the internet at your fingertips to not cheat on these. Not that I think anyone has, but don't cheat because there's really nothing to gain. It's more fun for people to just like, yeah, a NASA crypto investor. That's a good, that's a good answer. So if you don't know the answer, throw in a joke answer or, or do, yeah, Peter Parker's grandfather. I like these, these are good, these are good. So the question is, you know, we've, we've been talking about James Webb all night, the James Webb Space Telescope. Who? So who the heck is James Webb? Uh, you know, the original name for this, telescope was NGST, the Next Generation Space Telescope. And it wasn't till, you know, I don't know, what do you guys think, uh, like a decade ago or so? Less than a decade, I think, when it was finally like rebranded the James Webb Space Telescope. So who the heck is this guy? We got NASA CEO, a NASA crypto investor, an astronomer, NASA administrator, director of NASA, first NASA administrator, Peter Parker's grandfather. <laughs> Um, all, all fine guesses, all fine guesses. And the answer is indeed a NASA administrator. He was actually the second, uh, administrator at NASA. Um, but the, the, his major role was he oversaw NASA basically through all of the Mercury missions and the Gemini missions, the ones that were leading up to, uh, the manned, you know, the crewed Apollo missions that went to and landed on the surface of the moon. So he was like, he was administrator for almost a decade and really oversaw the direction of NASA. Um, there was a lot of, maybe not a lot of, there was some concern in the last few years about James Webb, uh, about his legacy, because I guess he was, he was overseeing NASA when there was a bunch of, um, you know, as was, was a, a problem of the time, uh, there was a lot of concern about uh, why can't I come up with the right words here? There was a lot of, there was, there wasn't the same treatment of people in the lesbian gay community as, as, as the hetero community. And he was overseeing that. And there was concern that maybe he was involved in kind of outing a bunch of um, LGBTQ people and, 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 and this reflected poorly on his name. And so he, he shouldn't have the telescope named after him which is a valid concern. Um, ultimately, NASA couldn't find you know, definitive proof that he was involved in this. And so they continued to name the telescope after him, which is their right to do. But ultimately, I think this is just problematic of naming things after people because people are flawed. And you know, why are we naming crap after people in the first place? Just name it the super cool telescope. It doesn't have to be named. It, uh, it doesn't have to be named after Colette. It doesn't have to be named after Sasha. It can just be named the badass telescope. And then you don't have worries about like if they did something wrong in their lives. So that's what I say. But ultimately, uh, James Webb is still the person that this is named after. I think he's the first administrator that a telescope is named after. Because, you know, we have like the Einstein telescope or the Chandra telescope or the Hubble telescope. But uh, I guess the administrators were cheesed off and they wanted they wanted it to be named after them too. So anyway. Yeah, it's not the most inspiring name if you ask me, you know, like who's it named after an administrator? Some I mean, I don't know. Who, who was like, <laughs> who was... yeah, exactly. Organizing people. Eh, eh. Yeah. I must say I've never seen a picture of him until now. Yeah. <laughs> Good looking guy, I guess, maybe. I don't know. Um, all right, moving on for directly imaged planets. Uh, re relevant to Sasha's presentation, how many times fainter are 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 these planets than their host star? 
Okay, at what wavelength? Oh, 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 <laughs> flawed question, <laughs> flawed question. Um, we'll say at the wavelengths of James Webb. So we'll say at a few microns. But that is a very good point, a very good point, Colette, that, that this is relevant to, or like relative to the wavelength of the light. So in optical, you might have a very different luminosity ratio than you would see in the infrared or, or something, or some other band. 10 times, a million times, 160,000 times. Some good ones here, really good ones. I prefer 10. Ooh, 20 fireflies. Somebody was paying attention. Someone was definitely, yeah, that blew my mind. So you said, if I've got the planet here in Los Angeles, it's, it's the equivalent of shining a, a uh, searchlight from San Francisco and a firefly next to that searchlight in that. That yeah, so the, the firefly and the searchlight are in San Francisco and, and you're I'm the observing. astronomer in Los Angeles with your telescope. Oh man, that sounds rough. That sounds... Depends on how much beer. I agree with that. As faint as they want. Um, 10 to the 6th. Excellent. Uh, what do you guys think? Colette, in, in yeah. infrared. Yeah, this is not my, my expertise. I'm going to guess a billion. Okay. That's a fair, fair, fair statement. Sash? Well, Colette, Colette's, uh, was right to ask what wavelength, because it does depend on the wavelength a little bit. But I think the numbers I said in my talk were sort of 10,000 to a million times mm. fainter. And that's a good order of magnitude for the, the near infrared. Oh, great. I, I kind of, I took the geometric mean of that. <laughs> great. <laughs> um, so in the optical, so in visible wavelengths of light, it would be closer to what Colette was saying. Like exactly. Yeah. If we're talking, and I should say also that this light that we're detecting from these directly imaged planets is, is the intrinsic light that they emit. It's not reflected starlight. Reflected. That's an important point. But in the optical, it would be more like reflected starlight. And that's a lot that's a much more challenging observation to make. I see. I see. Okay. Which would be more like a billion, like Colette said. So are all the directly imaged planets in the infrared then? The ones that have successfully been done? Yeah. And how many, ballpark, how many have we done that with? 20 to 30. Okay. Maybe less. Maybe 20 is a good number. Okay. And how many do you think we'll be able to do with JW? Um, hopefully we'll do all of them. Um, oh, but oh, okay. one of the things that Webb is going to be able to mainly possibly do is discover a new population of directly imaged planets, which are much, much less massive than the ones we know about now. These are sort of uh, analogs of our own Saturn or our own Neptune, potentially. But these have to be really far out from their star at sort of hundreds of astronomical units. But James Webb really does have the raw sensitivity to detect this totally new class of planets, which are like Saturn analogs. And that's so what we, we won't be do. able to see um, Earth scale or anything like that, partially because it's small and partially because it's super close to the host star. That's right. Got it. Okay. Cool. Excellent. All right. What will be the operating temperature of the James Webb Space Telescope? Because we know those heat shields are set up to keep things cool so that, so that it can operate but just how cold is it going to get? Because presumably HST is just basically room temperature out there because it's getting it's getting lit up by the sun every time. I mean, maybe there's some fluctuation when it's on the far side where it's blocked by the earth and the near side where, it's, where it encounters the earth, but um, it's probably just roughly room temperature, I imagine. But... And Spitzer was cold, had to be cold. Ooh, a couple Kelvin, three Kelvin, 10 Kelvin, 50 Fahrenheit, bold, switching to imperial units. Okay. People are going wild here. The answer is like 45 Kelvin. So like, you know, what is that? Negative 200. 
Celsius, negative 400 Fahrenheit, really cold, really cold. Um, because it has to, because the, you know, it's operating, it's trying to observe things in the infrared. And if it itself is warm, then, you know, as, as both Colette and Sasha were explaining in their, their talks, if it itself is warm, <laughs> then it acts as a source and you can't see the, the, the radiation from these distant, you know, infrared objects. So that's why you got all these baffles. You got all these heat shields radiating away all that, that, that hot radiation away so it can stay cold. It's kind of wild to me though. Um, I guess things get really cold on the far side of the moon when you got all that moon in the, in the, well, not the far side, when the moon's far side is away from, is, is facing away from the sun, it just gets really cold. And I guess if you just keep it permanently cold, then it gets really frigid. But, you know, on, like these polar craters on the surface of the moon, it gets so cold that they're just like these ice traps, right? So I guess Mercury too. Like and Mercury, Mercury has yeah, ice as right. poles. Yeah, that's right. So I guess this is just like that. And it just, yeah, that's wild. It's awesome. Um, okay. What is the, this is unrelated to the presentations, but I thought I'd throw this in there. What is the name of an object that is a hybrid between an asteroid and a comet? Since we're talking about solar system, exoplanet scale things. Comatoid. Oh, I like that. That's good. Whoa. <laughs> Asteret. Comatoid. Comatoid. Okay. Colette, do you ever deal with these sorts of things? In your I remember story? hearing about them, but I don't remember what the scientists called them. <laughs> Oh, I didn't know. Again, I'm Alex Trebek. I, I sound like I know everything, but I don't know. <laughs> Just look stuff up. But yeah, they, I know they discovered these asteroids that, you know, they're basically in the asteroid belt. So they're, they're not expected to have ice on them, but then they had, like when they actually took an image of it, it would have a tail. So right. they didn't really understand <laughs> how that happened. Yeah. So to, to, to extend on what uh, Colette was discussing in her in her Q and A, asteroids, you know, comets we generally refer to as like dirty snowballs. They're mostly composed of ices and such, and there's some um, there's some organic material and some some like non-organic dusty stuff in them that you know basically makes them like these dirty snowballs. And then asteroids kind of are the reverse. They're like icy dirt balls, or maybe they're just dirt entirely, or rock balls. Um, so this is kind of a, a combination of the two because things aren't usually so neatly put into bins. You have a continuum of behavior between different categories. And uh, these are called centaurs because they're like, you know, the, the traditional mythological centaur was half, half horse and half person. Um, so this is like half asteroid, half comet. And uh, in this plot, you can see N, U, J, and S representing the locations of, at this po moment in time, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then you can see the Kuiper belt out here of which Pluto and friends are kind of hanging out. And then the centaurs are the green objects. So these yeah. objects tend to hang out in the giant planet's orbits. Um, but because of their location from the sun, they're kind of like, oh, and the gray objects are the asteroid belt. So they're kind of like in between the asteroid belt's location from the sun and the comet's uh, location from the sun. And so they kind of have characteristics of both. But because they're like, going through the giant planet's orbits they're not very stable and they 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 don't stay in these orbits for very long but that's that's kind of so it may be I, that they're like comets that kind of like evaporated off a bunch of their stuff and so they're more dirt than ice at that point but they're kind of a mix or something i'm not sure if that is the asteroid belt i think those might be trojan asteroids oh you're right because they, they do look like they're kind of like... They're L1 attached to Jupiter there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I guess yeah. it maybe it isn't even showing the asteroid. I think it might there. even be closer in, yeah. No good call. Well, fake news from me. Thank you for calling it out, Colette. Thank you. Um, oh, and this is like one of the characteristic uh, centaurs. 2060 Chiron has an orbit that takes it 
again, in this, in this location, like just inside of Saturn and then outside of Uranus. And it's just hanging out in that, in that, that location and, and, and thus has kind of characteristics of the Kuiper belt out here and the asteroid belt in here. Anyway, I thought I'd mix it up so it wasn't all James Webb all the time for all these questions. And it was something related to, to uh, solar system and exoplanets. Okay, the mirrors of the James Webb Space Telescope are actually, despite the fact that they're substantially larger than the Hubble Space Telescope, they're about half the mass of HST. Um, what lightweight substance actually comprises them that's responsible for this? It's kind of a, oh, beryllium, hexagons, adamantium, ex excellent. Um, unobtainium, <laughs> yes. Unobtainium, straight from the core. That's like the worst movie ever made, the worst science. Have you guys seen that movie, The Core? Oh. Oh, you're really in for a treat. You really need to treat yourself this Friday night. Sit down to a viewing of the core about how they're going to restart the rotation of the Earth's core by sending some sort of submarine ship through the crust and the mantle. And oh, it's a it's a, it's a 90s favorite. Um, bubble wrap, light gold tinfoil, mercury. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Because James Webb is, you know, the diameter six and a half meters. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. yep. And HST is like two and a half, 2.4, 2.45, mm -hmm. something like that. So it's substantially larger and yet weighs substantially less. Um, but the answer correctly is beryllium. Beryllium, the, what is it? The fourth, the fourth element on the periodic table, super super low mass element. Um, and essentially it does this, this is, you know, an image of one of those hexagons that makes up the James Webb uh, aggregate of these 18 different hexagonal units that form together to make the mirror. And beryllium is, it's just very light and very strong. It tends to be a little bit brittle, but they have used beryllium in previous space telescopes. I think it was used in Spitzer as well. And it seems resistant to micrometeoroid impact. So even if little it gets pocked a little bit, it's not going to shatter the mirror if it gets struck by micrometeoroids on its way out to orbit. So, and there, there you have it. And then it gets surfaced with this little bit of gold, because gold's super, super reflective in the infrared. So I think the I think the thickness of the gold is like a tenth of a micron. It's like super, super tiny. Yeah. But I remember reading that the the entire like if you take up all the gold that was used to like coat all of these individual uh, mirrors that are made up, it only makes up the equivalent. If you if you take that and form it into a into a mass, it's only like the size of a golf ball. I mean that's still a lot of gold, but considering this thing is as enormous as it is, I guess it's not that. Much. It's not a cost driver. <laughs> it's not a cost driver. That's not that. Yeah, the ten billion didn't go into just buying gold to, uh, <laughs> to, to plate this thing. Um, Every space telescope's got to have a little bling. <laughs> Absolutely. When is the first launch of NASA's Artemis mission that's planned to return to the moon? You know, we haven't been to the moon since 1972 with uh, Apollo 17, and hopefully, we're going back as part of the Artemis mission. Um, so right now there are three Artemis missions that are nominally planned. The timeline was originally set during the Trump administration, uh, presumably to match Trump's second uh, second time in office. But um, I think Biden is largely held to that timeline. So, so 2025, 2026, very soon. December, to, whoa, somebody is optimistic. <laughs> December 20, in less than a month, we're going to be back at the moon, baby. Raise your hand if you could kind of see Cameron going out for the Artemis mission. Like, you know, I could I could see Cameron doing that. I'd like to. They didn't call me back. On this, uh, on this uh, the, um, the most recent astronaut application, the submission date, I think, was like February, just before COVID, uh, February of 2020. 
Um, they definitely de delayed the selection. I mean, they were supposed to announce it this summer, but but they didn't. But I have not got the call, so I I'm I, I think I'm I think I'm I'm out of this one. Are you sure your phone's turned on? Yeah. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta go. Yeah. Unfortunately, now I just got to pony up to to Elon and Bezos. Although I I don't think that's going to happen either. So I may be SOL on this one. Apollo's birthday. I don't know when Apollo's birthday is. Hmm. July 20th, 1969. Birthday, so maybe 2029. Hmm. Uh, anyway, the answer is Artemis 1 is supposed to launch in three, three months. Um, it will not be a crewed mission. It will be uncrewed, and it's going to be kind of like uh, some of the early Apollo missions where it just does a translunar orbit and goes around the moon and then comes back over the course of a couple of weeks. Um, Apollo, I'm sorry, Artemis 2 is nominally supposed to be in 2022, and that will be um, a crewed mission that goes up and orbits and then comes back down. And then Artemis 3 is nominally supposed to be the one that actually has crew that lands on the moon. And that'll be sometime, you know, according to the NASA timeline, sometime in like 2024, which is not very far away. Uh, but there is a, there's going to be a press release tomorrow on Tuesday by NASA that's talking about this timeline and whether or not, you know, they hold to this or not. So I don't know the future. I get paid by NASA, but I don't, I don't know any of their secrets, so I can't reveal them here, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, it's pretty exciting that, that this may happen in a reasonably short time scale. Okay. How far is James Webb going to be from Earth when it's in its orbit? What do you guys think? We're coming up on the end of the quiz. I don't want to keep people up too late. One million miles, two million miles, 133 miles. Ooh, that'd be hard to keep an orbit at 133. What is the lowest stable orbit? I don't think it's as low as 133. HST was at what, 400, 350? I think it was 570 on my slide. Oh, was it 570? Okay. Let me check. Yes, it has it as 570. 570. Oh, that, sorry, that's kilometers, so we'd have to convert to miles. Oh, yeah, okay, because I thought it was like, 570 should be like, yeah, four, uh, less than 360. That's like 330, 340, I think. So, um, but I don't know. Can, I don't, I think once you get substantially lower, you start running into atmosphere and it slows your orbit and then you're in trouble, right? So I don't think you can go too much. I don't, I don't think 133 miles is a valid orbit. <laughs> Hanging out at the moon. That's where I'd be. Half as far as the moon. Like 5 billion kilometers. I don't think that's valid either. We keep running. <laughs> one. Too far away to smell. Uh, I appreciate our audience and their creative responses. Um, so it's about a million miles away, but it's in this weird orbit, right? So here's the sun. Here's the Earth, and then here are these L uh, these L locations, which stand for Lagrange. So Lagrange point one, Lagrange point two, three, four, and five, and it's hanging out at L two, Lagrange point two, which is actually it just always sits in the shadow of Earth for the most part. Uh, well, L two itself does, and I guess uh, James Webb is going to be orbiting around that position. These Lagrange points are like semi-stable gravitational positions in any two two body gravitational interaction but for this we're describing the sun earth interaction so these are kind of like stable locations you could just hang out so that's why if this were jupiter and this is the sun these are the trojans which are you know kind of asteroid like that hang out at l4 and l5 and you can see these these little asteroid like things that just fall into this location because it's kind of stable it's kind of like a valley if you think about like gravitational things is like topographical things these are like little valleys where where things will just kind of fall into and sit because it's kind of stable there 
But just to clarify, it doesn't mean it's sitting still in space. It's actually orbiting around the sun, but exactly at the same rate that the Earth is, so it kind of stays in line. Exactly. That's an excellent point. Thank you, Colette. Um, I just wonder how much energy it takes to remain here. I guess not that much because they wouldn't have been able to put it with an infinite amount of uh, fuel to continue in its orbit. But I remember reading that it was something like the orbit of James Webb around L2 was something, it was actually larger, as you can see in this illustration, than the orbit of the Earth around them. I'm sorry, the orbit of the moon around the Earth. So it is actually like, it's really going, but um, but I guess it doesn't take a, a ton, ton of energy to do so. Um, as a, as a follow-up question that is not a question on our Menti, Menti uh, quiz, do you know other objects that have sat or will sit at Lagrange point two in the Earth-Sun system? Do you guys happen to know? Because I didn't know, but it's pretty interesting. There's a bunch of other space telescopes. Yeah, lots of lots of other satellites. I think Herschel was maybe at L2. That may be one of the ones. I The ones that I remember, WMAP, the one that did all the CMB mapping and, and um, told us about the cosmic microwave background at high resolution and stuff that was primarily done in the early, early 2000s. So WMAP was hanging out at L2. Um, Gaia, that's done all the cool stuff with, with um, mapping out stars at really, really high astrometric posi position is at L2. Uh, I think W first is gonna be at L2 as well. I mean, if you consider that this guy's orbit is larger than the moon, like that's a lot of space. So it's not like they're gonna slam into each other, but there's a bunch of things that hang out out there. I guess it's a pretty good spot. But we can't service it. No fixing it. Hopefully we didn't make any big mistakes like with HST's optics. So I heard rumors that that's not entirely true, that there are actually some like technical technological plans for something that could move quickly enough really? to get out there. Yeah, that was a rumor I heard. Oh, <laughs> I don't really? Really, oh, I don't that's any details cool. On it. Yeah, because that was what I used to say until I, I was at Space Telescope and they were like, well, actually, there is <laughs> there is like this slight possibility that there's something under development that could could go out there. It could actually go out there and service it like a like Apparently. a crewed mission that could go there or just I like don't think it. Yeah, I don't think it'd be a crewed mission. Whoa, that's awesome. Yeah, I heard the same rumor when I was at Space Telescope too, Colette. Um, <laughs> just, just to be clear, though, the instruments are not serviceable, but there's the possibility of refueling. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, and just for reference to our audience, Space Telescope, they're referencing Space Telescope as Space Telescope Science Institute, which is, um, it's a NASA center that's actually on the on the campus of Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland. And they're the people who run the Hubble Space Telescope and like do all the maintenance and communication with it, as well as now James Webb. So when you communicate, when when we have our, you know, our, our science that's done, it's done through Space Telescope Science Institute, and then they do all the logistics of actually talking to the telescope and pointing it where it's supposed to be and recording the photons that, that it intercepts and so on and so forth. So yeah, it's a cool spot uh oh yes big news in the astronomy community last week the astronomy decadal survey came out last week and it prioritized what astronomical goals in the next you know couple of decades so this happens every 10 years uh that we have one of these and everyone gets together and says oh what what do we really care about what are the next big things that we should care about and and then you know, a bunch of people kind of aggregate all the answers and say what's important and what we should be prioritizing. And that gets written up and it gets presented. And it was presented last Thursday. Uh, so it was all over the news, at least the news that astronomers care about. And and there were, of, of these seven options, uh, there were three, three options that were kind of highlighted. Um, a six meter class space telescope like James Webb, a telescope on the lunar surface, a dark matter detection experiment, an advanced radio telescope, a 30 meter ground based telescope, an advanced gravitational wave detector, 
and Star Wars based Happy Meals at McDonald's. <laughs> so what were the three of these wonderful seven options? Um, although I think all of these would be really good options, especially the Star Wars based Happy Meals. <laughs> that sounds pretty sweet. Although I don't know, getting the Star Wars franchise to agree. I mean, that's Disney and McDonald's. I feel like there may be a real, that might be a real hurdle getting them to agree on pricing and, yeah. and whatnot. So, uh, okay. So it looks like from our audience, telescope on, uh, if we go by the top three, telescope on the lunar surface, advanced gravitational wave detector, and then probably either 30 meter ground-based telescope or dark matter detection experiment are the most popular. And unfortunately, uh, only one of those is correct. So the three, the three things that were really highlighted, I mean, the, the, listen, the report is 650 pages long. So it's really, really long. And there's a lot of suggestions. But the three major highlights that, that I at least took out of this were a six meter class space telescope, a next generation, uh, what's called the next generation very large array, which is radio based uh, telescope, and then ground-based 30 meter telescopes. Those were the big, the big winners here. And because the entire astronomical community kind of voted, this will be taken to um, Congress and say, hey, this is what we want. And then hopefully Congress will abide and, and allow for money that goes towards these things. So it's kind of crazy that we're building another six meter space a class space telescope considering James Webb is about to launch. But this is a, a basically calling for a similar telescope to JWST, but in the that operates in the visible part of the spectrum and in the UV and a little bit in the infrared. So it's similar to the Hubble Space Telescope, except beefier, larger. Uh, the next generation very large array. People might have an idea of what the VLA is, the very large array is, if you've seen the movie Contact, uh, featuring Jodie Foster. Uh, that came out oh almost 25 years ago and this is that is the very large array it's in new mexico it consists of like 27 different antennae they'd all point towards one thing the next generation vla is like like 300 of those and it's not just in new mexico it's like spread out over the entire american southwest and then has like additional ones at other places in north america so it's pretty cool um and then what you're seeing here, this 30 meter class telescope. So right now the largest ground-based telescopes are 10 meters in diameter. The aperture is 10 meters. So like 30 feet across in aperture, like the Keck telescopes in Mauna Kea that, that uh, was referenced by Sasha and Colette earlier in the, in the evening. But those are the Keck telescopes right there. What's that? The Keck telescopes are in this image. Oh yeah, look, here's Keck. Keck the Keck telescopes out here. Um, there are a bunch of different consortia of universities as well as countries that are trying to work together to build these 30 meter class or basically 100 foot diameter aperture telescopes. Um, the main ones are the 30, it's called the T, astronomers aren't very creative in their naming convention. Um, there's the TMT, the 30 meter telescope, which is a different, a bunch of different universities and 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 countries that are working together to do that. Caltech is amongst those um, that was originally meant to be built on the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, although um, there was considerable holdup in that due to concerns that it was cultural appropriation and and taking over a, a sacred site to Native Hawaiians on the summit of Mauna Kea, um, and then the the Giant Magellan Telescope that is also being built by a kind of American groups that was meant to be built in Northern Chile in the Andes. And then there's the, what is it, the EELT? Is, it, is, is that its official name or is it just the ELT? Just the ELT, they dropped the first E. Oh, they did, okay. So the extremely large telescope, no, no names associated with this, just extremely large telescope, which I think is wonderful. And that also is meant to be built is, it, is that at La Silla? Is that? That's at Cerro Armazones. Oh, I don't know. Is that near? 
That's it's very obviously in the Andes. It's obviously in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. But where is where is Cerro Amazonas? It's near Cerro Paranal, where the What's current ESO telescopes are. Okay, so it's near the. So so the ELT, the extremely large telescope, will be built near the VLT, the very large telescope, um, in northern Chile. That's right. Awesome. Okay. So yeah, essentially, people said we want to build these things, and hopefully. The American government through the National Science Foundation will contribute towards the construction of the American components of this. Okay. Oh yeah. And here's the VLA. This is the VLA. And now we're going to have, instead of 27 of these, we're going to have like 300 of these, which is pretty sweet. Um, okay. I think this may be the last question. What are the fo four most common elements in life on earth? This was covered in Colette's presentation. We've got a lot of different options. Feel free to vote on what you think is the, there are four, so you can vote up to four times on these wonderful things. Hydrogen, helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, silicon, iron, and unobtainium. Okay, all right. votes okay people are going people are backtracking through the youtube stream to see what exactly colette said in her presentation oh we get one vote for unobtainium i appreciate that thank you I found out in talking with some engineers earlier this week that unobtainium, I thought it was just a product of science fiction films because it's used in both the core, as I already referenced, one of the finest science fiction films ever <laughs> produced, but it's also in um, Avatar, you know, the, you know, the most profitable film ever made. And, but I guess that is just like a term used in engineering communities for some sort of fantastical, element with some unknown equation of state that fits whatever you're trying to fit into a particular niche. So kudos to the to the engineers. Good work, guys and ladies. So I think the answer is pretty clear. People did a pretty good job here in getting Chon, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen. Uh, do you want to do you want to talk about this at all Colette since this was your your business well I just want to say that in addition to the water story with all the delivery of the comets like every every one of these atoms has some crazy story that is only half figured out for how it got to the earth <laughs> so it's just uh it's much more complicated than than you might think that's fair that's fair but in general all of these elements are very uh are, are produced that have a very high concentration, not just in life on the earth, but a high concentration in the universe just because of stellar nucleosynthesis and, and these, these things. So you see a lot of these contents everywhere, but uh, certainly in biological matter. Yeah, that is the end. That is the end of our, our quiz. So, Unfortunately, I can't track who won and who lost, but I imagine you probably kept track. So congratulations to the winners. Um, and and uh, I'm hoping that we will be able to return to in-person events come January. And then we will uh, then we will certainly have prizes for all of you again. Some sort of cool prizes. But yeah, as I said before, I'll try and record these events, even if we go back to in-person. So those of you who aren't local will still be able to, to, to see what's going on and participate in some capacity. Um, Where do you hold it? Lucky Baldwin's? No. So <laughs> historically, we held it at uh, Der Wolfskopf, which oh. is this German beer bar on Fair Oaks, just north of Colorado. So it's only a few blocks from Lucky Baldwin's. I like Lucky Baldwin's a lot. I went there initially to see if they'd host it, but they're they're kind of a small spot and they weren't really interested because they were like, Bleh. 
I came in and I was like, hey, I want to I want to host an event. A bunch of astronomers will come and give talks. And they were like, what <laughs> what, that sounds stupid. And then the guy at Dear Wolf was like, oh, yeah, we could get into that. And now, like, at, at our heyday, our events were the biggest events that brought in, you know, on a Monday night, we had, you know, three times what they'd have on a typical Friday night. So they were really happy with us. But no, I think, did you ever, well, both of you were here. Colette, you were an, an undergrad here. Is that right? Grad student. Oh, you were a grad. You were undergrad MIT and then grad here. Is that right? Okay. And Sash, you were here as a postdoc. Yeah. Did you guys ever go to a bar called Tea Boils? No. It's We're a sure. super divey bar that's right up Wilson, <laughs> Wilson in Colorado. Um, but it's a really large space and they have a decent beer selection and it's, but it's like divey and cheap. So I'm going to see about going there. The problem with our current place, the wolf is um, since the pandemic, there's been, it's gone, it's taken a downturn and they're, they had like a stabbing and some bar fights that hmm. resulted in like people getting hospitalized. So I don't want, I don't want our people to get stabbed. So I think we're going to move to a different spot. Anyway, um, thank you both for your participation tonight. Thank you for excellent presentations and uh, great responses to the various questions and my stupid quiz as well. So much appreciated. Thank you, Colette, for staying up till 1230 in the morning. And thank you, Sasha, for getting up at 4 a.m. in the UK to give this talk, although I still don't see a beer in your hand, so I'm a little bit disappointed there, but but uh, I understand you're a father. You have it's under the table. <laughs> Thank um, you, Cameron, for organizing this. It was fun. Oh yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is just fun. I get to talk about space and drink beer, so it's cool. Um, <laughs> and thank you to our audience for, for tuning in on your Monday night and uh, Again, we will have our second in the James Webb Space Telescope series will be a month from tonight. Well, not tonight. It'll be Monday, December 5th or 6th. I forget exactly, but it'll be the Monday. And it will feature James Webb Space Telescope uh, themed stuff. But whereas tonight was on planets and exoplanets, this will be featuring galaxies and cosmological large scale structure aspects of what James Webb is going to study. So. Uh, including one of the members, uh, Christina Williams, who is on the team that's designed one of the instruments that's going up into space near, near CAM. So that'll be super cool. Um, they're both great speakers, Justin Spilker and Christina Williams, and I'm really looking forward to it. So I, I encourage everybody to come back and it'll be fun. And then we have a stargazing lecture that will happen in about 10, I think it's November 19th, so 11 days. It's a week from this Friday, and it'll be on accreting black holes so that should be really cool too. So I encourage people to, to check it out. But thanks everybody. And I guess we'll see you guys in a month. Cool.